just got mixed um, with another slide, uh, another webinar. So uh, I will just um, uh, start uh, and present our first um, uh, moderator, if I can say so. So uh, my co-moderator for uh, tonight, Professor Bogdan Popescu, uh, a professor at University of Medicine and Pharmacy, Carl Davila in Bucharest, Romania. He's the head of the cardiology department and the, uh, of the Institute of Cardiovascular Diseases, Professor Iliescu. Um, Professor Popescu is the president of the Romanian Society of Cardiology uh, and is the past president of the EAPCI. Thank you very much for joining us, Professor Popescu. Um, and thanks for, for taking the time to, to do this. Thank you very much, Alexandro. It's a great pleasure. Thanks for your kind invitation. I hope the audience will benefit from the expertise of our four distinguished guests. And we specifically selected a very broad uh, and very practical topic of tips and tricks in ECHO, trying to discuss four different settings, which are very common in daily practice. And it's my pleasure to have with us Professor Alan Klein, Dr. Denis Ambraru, Professor Elif Saden, Professor Roxy Senior, uh, who will share with us their experience, we would kindly ask you to ask your questions through the chat. We will have the chance to discuss with the experts um, about their presentations and uh, their uh, suggestions on these highly relevant topics. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Alan Klein from the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, Alan is a past president of the American Society of Echocardiography and he will talk to us about the practical applications of diastolic function assessment. Alan, please. Okay, uh, thank you, um, Bogdan. It's a great pleasure uh, in being here. Can you hear me? Um, well, uh, yes. first of all, uh, welcome from America. Uh, those who celebrate Thanksgiving, happy Thanksgiving. Um, so what I've been asked to do is talk about um, tips and tricks and echo, and I'm gonna focus on practical application of diastolic function assessment. I'd like to give a general introduction, talk about the, the guidelines, um, what echo parameters do you measure? Um, what do we mean by myocardial pathology and getting into the second algorithm and supplementary uh, parameters? When I was president of the ESC, uh, I wrote a president's page called Diastology. What does the new updated guideline do for you? And there's a lot of controversy in the US about these guidelines. Uh, and there's a ongoing dialogue. Uh, one person wrote uh, on ASC Connect, I had a discussion with a cardiologist who doesn't believe in the assessment of diastolic function. In the same sitting, somebody also wrote, Diastology finally makes sense a big thanks to the writing group. So very, uh, very disparate uh, comments. In addition, in the US, um, some people who don't use the guidelines well, saying that there's an epidemic of indeterminate diastolic function. So in, these, in this seminar, uh, webinar, I like to show how we can lessen indeterminate diastolic function assessment. In terms of the guidelines, the key diastolic parameters that we measure are simple ones. Left atrial volume index, mitral um, E and A wave, tissue Doppler E prime, and TR velocity. And all these reflect elevated filling pressure. And as you know, in the guidelines, uh, there's algorithm one, uh, where uh, briefly they have four different parameters, uh, E V prime more than 14, a low tissue Doppler, 
a high TR velocity and a, a large left atrial volume index. If most are uh, positive, you have diastolic dysfunction. If most are negative, you have normal diastolic function. And in between, uh, we can't call it, so it's called indeterminate. Now, the second algorithm is the ones that most people use. And this, um, to get in this algorithm, you have to have a high likelihood of diastolic dysfunction and to have myocardial pathology. And very briefly, you stratify based on EA ratio. And then uh, you have two extremes, um, grade one diastolic function on the far left and grade three diastolic function on the far right. And in between you have uh, EV prime, more than 14 TR, more than 2.8, left atrial volume index more than 34. And in between, uh, once again, if you're missing parameters, uh, this is indeterminate. So what parameters um, do most people measure? The mitral inflow, very standard measurement where you can measure the height of the E wave and A wave, uh, deceleration time, uh, isovolumic relaxation time. And if you wanna measure left, left ventricular end diastolic pressure, you can measure the duration of the A wave. So what are some tips and tricks? So obviously you need good, uh, good imaging. In the US, we have sonographers um, that, that measure these things. So apical four chamber view, you put color flow imaging for optimal alignment. You need a very relatively small sample volume of one to three millimeters placed at the leaflet tips. If you wanna measure um, um, A wave duration, you have to put up the annulus, optimize the gain and the wall filters, and the sweep should be between 50 and 100 millimeters per second. So here's an example of a incorrect and a correct um, sample volume placement. So if you place it too high towards the apex, you get a poor um, mitral inflow, very feathery. And if you place it at the tips, you get a very clean uh, looking mitral inflow. And as I mentioned, uh, things that you measure are E waves, A waves, deceleration time, the ratio. Uh, limitations, if you have a fast heart rate sinus tachycardia, uh, conduction system disease, um, arrhythmias, PVCs, um, a severe aortic regurgitation that, um, that will uh, go towards the mitral inflow. It's hard to measure mitral inflow. Um, now let's, let's turn to tissue Doppler. Tissue Doppler, you're trying to measure the angular E prime velocity. And what, is, what are some tips and tricks? So you need a very good apical four chamber view. You need a wider sample volume uh, between five and 10 millimeters placed uh, at or within one centimeter of mitral leaflet insertion sites. Uh, optimize gain and filter and minimize the angle of incidence. And you need a velocity scale 20 centimeters above and below baseline with a sweep speed of 50 to 100. Uh, the things that you would measure would be the E prime velocities at the septal and the lateral. You may want to average that to calculate the EV prime. Limitations are uh, if you have, if you have surgery on the mitral valve, a mitral valve ring or repair, if you have a mechanical valve or a prosthetic valve, if you have severe, moderate to severe angular calcification, mitral stenosis, and severe mitral regurgitation, probably limitations to E prime velocities. So here's an example of a good placement and a bad placement. So here's bad placement. You put it in the wrong spot and probably the, the wrong sample volume and you don't have very much, uh, very good um, E prime velocity. When you place it in the, um, the proper spot and a, a wide sample volume size, you get a very precise E prime uh, lateral velocity of uh, five. A common mistake is um, don't measure the first downward deflection. So uh, shown in the diagram, um, the first uh, downward deflection is actually isovolumic uh, relaxation and don't mix that up with the E prime. So that's a, that's a common mistake. Uh, the next uh, key parameter is the left atrial volume index. You have two met methods. You have Simpson's method or area length method. Most people use Simpson's method and you divide that left atrial volume by the body surface area to get the left atrial volume index. Uh, here's a two chamber view and a four chamber view. Um, so very important, some tips and tricks. The LV and LA lie in different planes. So you wanna first of all, avoid foreshortening of the left atrium. The base of the atrium should be its largest size and the LA length should be maximized. So just to show you that there's different planes of the LV 
and the LA. So you have to be, you have to focus on the, the best plane, the largest plane uh, for the LA to, to measure left atrial volume index. Uh, so here's an example of the left atrial volume measurements in the four chamber and a two chamber view. And uh, precisely the um, left atrial volume index is 32 mLs per meter square, where the cutoff is um, more than uh, 34. Uh, so some measurement tips. Uh, do not include the left atrial appendage in your measurement, as shown on the right, or the pulmonary veins and the LA tracings, uh, shown on the left. And the other tip is that the long axis, the length, should be within five millimeters of the, uh, of the two views. Okay, peak TR velocity. So that's, um, that's our Achilles heel in the, in the US. Often TR is not there, uh, bad velocity. So you need very good diligence. Um, you scan from multiple views. And if you cannot get it, you can use agitated saline to enhance the signal to noise ratio. Uh, and you hear much more about contrast, uh, more uh, you know, second generation contrast and, and agitated saline. You wanna measure full uh, well-developed envelopes. Now, if you really can get, a, get, can get the TR, you can look at for the, um, the PR signal perhaps to calculate a mean PA pressure or PA end diastolic pressure. So here's an example on the left, um, it's a poor velocity, uh, not the best angle. And when you give um, agitated saline, uh, you can see that the velocity uh, was 2.8 before and now it's 3.6. So much more enhanced uh, velocity. As I said, often TR could be missing. Uh, the, uh, one of the final things I like to talk about is the algorithm too. Uh, who gets into the algorithm too? Those with myocardial pathology. So this is somebody who's likely to have elevated filling pressures. Uh, algorithm two, myocardial pathology means if you have extensive cardiac history, if you have known uh, uh, CAD with wall motion as shown in the upper, um, upper diagram, if you have LVH, hypertensive heart disease as shown in the middle diagram, uh, cardiomyopathy as shown in the bottom, this is amyloid. Uh, if you know already that there's HEPPEF, uh, if the parameters from algorithm one are all positive, if your ejection fraction is reduced, or if you have, let's say, L wave or uh, large atrial reversal in the pulmonary vein gets you into the algorithm too. Most people use this, um, um, this um, algorithm for most echo labs for myocardial pathology. Now, um, recently, Dr. Smyseth and the, um, and the working group on the guidelines have talked about um, supplementary measures. So you still can measure deceleration time of the mitral E wave. Uh, you can look at the, um, the difference between the A wave and mitral and the uh, duration and the H reversal. Uh, if it's more than 30 milliseconds, uh, LVDP is more than 15. If the uh, pulmonary vein S to D ratio is low, um, especially with a reduced ejection fraction, and these are indicative of elevated filling pressures. Uh, we often measure strain, so I think strain should be part of this in the future uh, guidelines. If your strain is normal, especially the LV, uh, think twice. Uh, you know whether uh, you can reclassify it, maybe from indeterminate to, to to normal or grade one, or if your left atrial reservoir strain. There's sort of a um, an explosion of interest in um, in, in LA strain. If it's uh, less than 20%, uh, this is often abnormal, and this may help uh, reclassify some of the patients. Um, I'm not going to cover special population. That's another time. So if you have any of these, for example, AFib or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or restriction, um, mitral stenosis, you, know, you need uh, more special um, uh, techniques or different, different uh, algorithms than the traditional. So these are not, uh, uh, should be used with the, um, with the algorithms I mentioned. Uh, so in summary, um, Mr. Chairman, um, it's a great pleasure in uh, talking uh, on this webinar. So the take home points for um, diastolic function. So the in parameters are simply EA ratio, tissue Doppler, E primes, left, left atrial volume index and RVSP. Uh, important um, to uh, understand the clinical setting. So you have to know the history. What are the 2D findings? Is there LVH? Um, you wanna emphasize technical quality of the signals. Important to understand who gets into the second algorithm with myocardial pathology. In the future, I think we should be using LV and LA strain to reclassify indeterminate. 
and in your echo report, try to measure LV filling pressures and grade of diastolic function. So if you didn't understand anything, um, you, can, you can buy the book that just came out today. Actually, I was in my office today and uh, I have a picture of the book. It just uh, came to my office. So this is a book of diastology um, uh, recently published by Elsevier. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Cohen. Uh, first of all, happy Thanksgiving and uh, happy Thanksgiving to all our American viewers. Um, and uh, the second, uh, where where would we buy uh, your book? Is it available on Amazon yet, or uh... Uh, the book is available uh, on uh, on Amazon? Uh, it's uh, on Facebook, uh, Twitter. You see, but Elsevier. If you just go Elsevier website, uh, it, it could be bought. Um, it's uh, I, it's quite it's one hundred ninety nine dollars US, well, whatever that translates into euros. But uh, it's a uh, our second edition and uh, has thirty six chapters from uh, how you measure to um, uh, CRT to uh, cardio oncology to uh, anesthesia. So it's quite a comprehensive uh, textbook. Great, thank you. We we saved okay. some money from uh, not going to all these congresses, so uh, I think uh, most of us. Can afford it so uh, we will uh, go on forward with our webinar i have the the pleasure to present uh, dr denisa moraru uh, which uh, is a cardiologist uh, practicing in italy uh, is uh, uh, part of the esc education committee member um, and uh, she will present uh, to us uh, practical tips for 3d echography thank you very much denisa for being with us today Thank you, Alexandru. It's a great pleasure for me to, to be here and participate in this webinar. So in the next 10 minutes, I will uh, try to provide some practical tips on uh, transthoracic 3D echocardiography, which is relatively less used with respect to 3D uh, transesophageal echocardiography. And since I had uh, 10 minutes, I have come up with uh, 10 rules, which are very simple, but uh, important uh, for the successful acquisition. So first of all, very practically, um, the most important thing is to come up with a clinical question, which is the clinical question in your patient. For instance, if you have a patient with a worsening dyspnea, fatigue, uh, diarrhea, skin flushing, and hepatomegaly, you might want to look at the tricuspid valve carefully in order to exclude a possible uh, carcinoid tricuspid valve disease. And so what you can do is to uh, look first in 2D, uh, and identify the best uh, two-dimensional window for the structure of interest. Uh, so in this case, for the tricuspid valve, you might look from the parasternal right ventricular inflow view at uh, the tricuspid valve leaflet or uh, the apical right ventricular focus view. And uh, depending on uh, the patient that you are scanning, it may be that one or the other has a uh, better image quality. And this is important because this is uh, the approach that you are going to use to uh, try to obtain a good 3D acquisition. If both are uh, good quality, like in this case, in this patient, you have to realize that from the parasternal approach, for instance, since there is uh, the benefit of axial and lateral resolution, there you have more clear, more well-defined, better spatial resolution. While on the right, as you can see, this is an apical acquisition. Still the image quality is okay, but there is less definition. Uh, on the other hand, you are able to include more structures in the view, for instance, the pulmonary valve, and you can see better also the surrounding structures like uh, the mitral valve. So what makes a good 3D echo image? How we can define what is a good image? First of all, it has to have a high spatial resolution, a sufficient temporal resolution for the purpose, for quantification or for anatomical purposes. It has to have a high signal to noise ratio, no artifacts ideally, should include the entire structure of interest in the image and also some landmarks for orientation to understand which is the anterior part, the posterior part and so on. It should be realistic, so more similar to anatomy as possible, should have some uh, attractive color maps. And finally, some cosmetics, I will show you, it's important also for the wow effect. 
Um, when you compare trans thoracic with respect to transesophageal images, of course, many of us pre still prefer transesophageal. However, in most of our patients, um, it may be enough to also to uh, limit yourself to trans thoracic 3D echocardiography in order to answer the clinical question. You don't have to get so much detail unless the patient is a candidate for procedure or for surgery. But for instance, in this case where you see a mitral valve flail, uh, you, it's enough the transthoracic 3D acquisition to define the mechanism, the regurgitation. Of course, if you want to see the, the rupture cord, you uh, need a, a better, or the secondary prolapses, for instance, you need a, a better spatial resolution. So how to achieve high spatial resolution? You need uh, to understand that you cannot have the most spatial, temporal resolution, volume size, everything. You, there is a trade-off between all these three things. So first of all, in order to increase the quality, the spatial resolution, you need to obtain uh, the maximal density of the scan lines. It, usually it is uh, obtained by a multi-bit acquisition if the patient is in sinus rhythm. Then uh, yeah, the narrow the volume, it's better just to include the structure of interest. You should favor the window in which the structures are closer to the probe. For instance, the parasternal ashmar are much better if they are good quality. You should place the structure of interest in the center of the 3D volume to achieve the highest spatial resolution and also to increase the frequency. Whenever possible, obviously, you should go for transesophageal. And then the rule number three is to decide what you want the most in your patient. You need to look at the anatomy. You need to look at uh, the papillary muscles, subvalvular apparatus, morphology of the right ventricle. Then you need to favor the spatial resolution. But if you want quantitative data like volumes, ejection fraction, you need to favor the temporal resolution. And then there is a question which is the optimal temporal resolution for quantification of the volumes. You have to realize if, is that if you have a single bit acquisition, for instance, with an insufficient temporal resolution, this may lead to errors in the identification of the end diastole and end systole. So you will get smaller volumes and lower ejection fraction. Therefore, it, there are no strict guidelines, but the opinion of the experts say that at least 20 volumes per second could be enough for a normal heart rate. And if the patient is tachycardic, then you should have at least 30 volumes per second. For more sophisticated analysis like 3D strain, the recommended frame rate is more than 36, 50 volumes per second. So you definitely need a six bit acquisition. What happens if uh, with the image quality, if you increase the frame rate by the dedicated knob on the machine? You should not do this uh, if you, uh, your aim is to get good quality images, because if you do so, yes, you will increase the temporal resolution as you can see from this example here, 44 volumes per second, but the image quality will decrease because the only way to increase the temporal resolution is by reducing the uh, density of the uh, scan lines. So you shouldn't do that if your aim is to get nice, pretty pictures. Another important rule is to use a cutout bed and uh, optimally it's much better to scan from the left side of the patient. Obviously in these times is not a good idea if you are uh, scanning uh, in uh, nowadays with a COVID risk and so on, it's much better to scan on the right. However, for 3D echo acquisition, this allows to prop properly position the probe for uh, the right ventricular focus view and to scan much better the right uh, structures. Here is a protocol that we have recently uh, published and you can uh, uh, consult uh, uh, because uh, now we have a limited time, but basically we recommend to position the time gain compensation in the middle to increase a little bit the gain to avoid the dropout, but not to exaggerate because this will increase also the noise. Another important practical tip is to not forget using the respiratory maneuvers. I would say in every patient, because the most frequent reason that I see for suboptimal 3D transthoracic images is a poor timing with patient breath holding respiration and with the action on the button that starts the acquisition. So what we usually do, like uh, uh, it happened uh, a few days ago in our lab, for instance, in this patient, not the perfect image quality, but as you can see as the patient is freely breathing, the image comes in and off. And usually we use the multi-slice to look at the aspect. And you can see when the patient breathes in, so it takes an inspiration, the image disappears. 
but the best image quality is in expiration. So you understand then, and then you explain to the patient to stop breathing at expiration and to not uh, do any inspiration because some patients understand that when they have to hold the breath, they have to uh, get uh, uh, the air in and this is not good, of course. So this is how it should look like, a well-timed acquisition, full expiration, you then you ask the patient to breath hold and there you have a stable image quality and a good acquisition that you can quantify. Sometimes, even if the 2D image quality looks nice, like in this case, the 3D looks bad. It's important to go and understand why it happens because this in time will help you improve your 3D skills. So first, you need to look at the cropping plane, where it is the cropping plane. If the cropping plane is too far away, you should get closer. If it's not parallel with the valve, you should try to obtain a parallel alignment. And sometimes we have these artifacts that you can avoid by lowering the cropping plane and being very close to the structure of interest. Finally, uh, sometimes uh, I see that some echocardiographers, when they do not see very well, then there is a dropout, they try to increase the 2D gain, hoping that it helps. With 3D, this is not a good idea. So you see, when you increase the 2D gain, you will not see better the leaflets, but you will just increase is the background noise. The idea is that if you have a, a, a dropout in the leaflets, you should reacquire again, trying to optimize better the original 2D image and avoiding the leaflet dropout, even if it's intermittent. So this is how it should look like. A good acquisition should be really black and white, so black cavity, white structures without artifacts, without reverberations. And finally, my last, but I think also important advice is to know your 3D echo machine. Try to learn at best your, your scanner in your lab. Start with one, because if you start with uh, working on several uh, scanner, it's more confusing. And then also a little tricks like in this example here will help you uh, get beautiful images from the same data set just by learning to uh, control a few tricks. And finally, this is my um, last advice. Do not stop learning. There are new tools every day. There are new features every day. And so in 3D, this is the best, but also the challenge of, of 3D Echo. Uh, you always have something uh, new to, to learn. If you want to see more of imaging, I invite you to uh, join us uh, for the ESCVI Best of Imaging 2020 on 11, 12 December. This is a virtual Congress and that will be uh, really amazing. And you are invited uh, to join us because it is free. Thank you very much for your attention. Great, great talk. Thank you very much, Denisa. Uh, it is not by chance that Denisa is the uh, chairman of the education committee of the ACVI. Uh, it's my great pleasure now to introduce Professor Elif Sadeh. Elif is Professor of Cardiology at the Bashkent University in Ankara, and she's also the Vice President of the EACVI for the ECHO section. will talk to us about tips and tricks in Doppler echocardiography. Elif, please. Thank you very much, Bogdan. I am really delighted to contribute to this webinar and uh, excited to meet with the amazing number of audience tonight. So um, I must first tell that when you do your Doppler studies, there are more tips than tricks. And uh, these tips uh, stand on simple rules. The rule number one to remember is the uh, Doppler equation. Doppler equation which, um, uh, which necessitates an insonation angle uh, less than 20 degrees. So be generous and be stubborn to obtain multiple views in order to align your ultrasound beam with the flow direction as much as possible and to capture correct velocities and uh, correct gradients. The second uh, rule is the aliasing. Uh, when you use pulse wave Doppler, you have a finite sample size where you register the velocities. Uh, but pulse wave Doppler is, uh, works on the basis of pulse repetition frequency, and it has a velocity range adjusted. Make sure that you register 
the modal velocity, which is the brightest signal that represents the laminar flow. You cannot resolve high velocities with pulse wave Doppler. If you want to do so, you will be challenged by aliasing. It means that you will be you will miss the integrity of your signal and you will miss the peak of your velocity. However, with continuous wave Doppler, there is no aliasing because continuous wave Doppler does not work with uh, pulse repetition frequency. Uh, however, the problem with continuous wave Doppler is that you register all the velocities down your ultrasound beam, which gives you some location ambiguity. So you will obtain signals like this, um, the signal, a complete signal with some shades, but overlapping signals coming from your ultrasound beam all the way down your ultrasound beam. Color Doppler works on the basis of pulse wave Doppler with several sample volumes. So the transducer frequency uh, is again a limitation and we are again facing aliasing. The aliasing is uh, limited, uh, defined by the Nyquist limit with color Doppler and with uh, your Nyquist limit should not be less than 50 centimeter per second uh, in the apical views. You should also be careful to optimize the color gain in order to avoid the random noise. But color Doppler is very useful and robust to discriminate uh, turbulent uh, pathologic jets to determine the jet direction and flow convergence. There are some other little tips to remember all the time. Always keep in mind that the instantaneous pressure gradient between two compartments is the main driver of your flow. The signal contours are determined by instantaneous pressure gradients and the anatomical details. And um, your signal duration is your flow duration. Look at the relationship of your Doppler signal with the cardiac cycle. Here is, as you can see from, uh, this is an eccentric mitral regurgitation because it's in systole and this is a diastolic paravalvular aortic leak. And always look at the EKG carefully in order to better and correctly interpret your Doppler signals. Having said that, let's see some examples. Here is a patient with ischemic mitral regurgitation. Look at the continuous wave Doppler signal, and these are all mitral regurgitations. The continuous wave Doppler signal is fainting in mid-systole. Obviously, this is not an artifact, but this Doppler signal is telling me that the uh, regurgitation is decreasing in mid-systole because of the increasing systolic forces that are exerted on the mitral leaflets and that uh, force the leaflet to close better. So when the left ventricular pressure increases, the regurgitant orifice area decreases. And this is a representation also of the um, dynamic nature of ischemic, uh, the regurgitant orifice area of an ischemic mitral regurgitation. Here is another example of mitral regurgitation. Look at this, uh, these signals with stop flow at mid-systole. This is from a patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And the signal is telling me that the flow is going away from the mitral, mitral valve because it is going into the aneurysmatic, aneur uh, apical aneurysm. Uh, of this patient with uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and mid KVT obliteration. Here is another example. Look at this mitral regurgitant signal. Uh, the signal appears only at mid and late systole. This is not an artifact, but this is a typical 
uh, appearance in a patient with mitral valve prolapse if there is no flail leaflet. Um, that's another uh, that's another example with multiple MR jets. The continuous wave Doppler gives you all the way down different jets with different densities. Here are two different jets. One is central with a um, larger regurgitin orifice and the other one is coming from a perforation at the base of the mitral leaflet uh, and it produces a jet much more turbulent and with higher velocity because the regurgitin orifice is much smaller and these jets are superimposed, as you can see with different densities. And finally, that's another example from a patient with diastolic mitral regurgitation um, because of very high end diastolic left ventricular pressure. Uh, which exceeds by a few millimeter mercury the left atrial pressure. This is the reason why the mitral regurgitation starts uh, during end diastole before the QRS complex. So, of course, these patterns, if you consider these different jet patterns, none of these are amenable to quantification by a simple PISA method. Uh, here is another, uh, <clears throat> another example to show you that uh, color extent can be misleading. This is a patient with severe pulmonic regurgitation. By looking at this uh, pulmonic regurgitant flow going back into the RVOT, this small uh, non-turbulent uh, red color uh, Doppler, uh, it's difficult to convince you that this is severe regurgitation, but indeed it is a severe regurgitation. Let's look at the details. Here is the continuous wave Doppler and it has a very uh, steep deceleration time because of the equalization of the pressures between the pulmonary artery and the right ventricle in diastole. In addition, there is a premature integrate flow in the RVOT towards the pulmonic valve, which is induced by the right atrial contraction due to the very high right ventricular and diastolic pressure. And right ventricular and diastolic pressure is high because the pulmonic regurgitation is severe. And finally, if you look at the branch pulmonary arteries, you will see the reversal coming back from these branches, these this red color. So if you look at the details of your Doppler signals, you can interpret accurately the hemodynamic data. And Doppler signals really will tell you much more than you would have expected. Uh, so there are not there 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 are not uh, tricks, but there are tips when you do your Doppler imaging. Always remember the properties of different Doppler modalities. <laughs> Integrate the Doppler data with the hemodynamics and the anatomy. Uh, tracks are actually mainly driven by formulas when assumptions are not properly met. With that, I would like to finish and thank you for your kind attention. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Alif. Uh, thank you for your presentation. It was very, very interesting. Uh, because we are lacking time, I will pass the word to Professor Roxy Senior, which is um, uh, speaking from London, from the Heart and Lung Institute at the Imperial uh, College. Uh, he's the director of echocardiography lab at Royal Brompton Hospital. Um, and he will present tips and tricks in contrast echo. Uh, hi, Professor Roxy Senior. So, hi. unfortunately, um, I uh, we learned that you don't have a, a video because, unfortunately, the computer got stuck. But yes. we will be able to see you and we will be able to follow your presentation. So, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Uh, you need to disable the screen sharing. Is that right, uh, Alex? It's done. Yeah. All right. Okay. All 
Okay, uh, you can see the screen? Yes. Okay, so uh, my talk is on tip and uh, tips and tricks in contrast echo. So I'll be talking about second generation contrast echo, uh, which opacifies and uh, uh, the heart and stays in the circulation for a longer time uh, to see every part of the heart. So this is the summary of the main recommendation by ESCBI 2017 uh, recommendation published that contrast agents should be used if two or more segments are not visualized and to better assess structural abnormalities, especially the apical abnormalities. And in stress echo, even if all segments visualized at rest uh, are visualized as rest, if images deteriorate during inspiration, then contrast must be used. Myocardial perfusion assessment is recommended if expertise exists in the department. And I'll show you some very quick examples of the utility of contrast. So this is a patient who presented to, um, uh, to us uh, with COVID pneumonia, and the patient had in, um, hemodynamic instability, recurrent arrhythmias, high uh, biomarkers, and echo was requested. And you can see from this echo, it's very difficult to make out whether the LV is normal or abnormal, whether there's regional wall motion abnormality or not. And, but when we injected contrast, you can now very clearly see that the LV ejection fraction is normal. You can see the wall thickening very clearly, and there's no regional wall motion abnormality. The patient was managed accordingly. Now, this is another example of another patient uh, admitted with COVID in, uh, with, in HDU. You see a dilated LV, a dilated RV, but you see at the apex, there's something going on at the apex. It's rather thick there. And remember, in COVID patients, they have a high thromboembolic uh, phenomena. So the question is whether there's a thrombus here. So it's very difficult to say whether it's a thrombus just looking at this image. So we injected contrast. And now the contrast has come in. Now you can clearly see, you see a lot of trabeculations, but no real thrombus. Now, this is an example from another patient. Now, this is not a COVID patient. This is from an outpatient referred to us for stress echo, young female, diabetic. Very important to know whether the patient has got coronary artery disease because the patient is diabetic. At the same time, we don't want to send the patient to any other investigation, but echo because it is safe. But this is the image of the left ventricle. You can hardly see anything, but when we injected contrast, you can see on the, on the left, is the rest image on the right is the stress image after exercise. And you can see even at rest, there is an apical septal wall motion abnormality, and this deteriorated to a large area of wall motion abnormality. This patient had severe proximal LAD disease. And then we have another example now of another patient, 61 year old male with atypical angina, right? And this is the stress echo, rest stress. And here you can see, you know, it looks perfectly normal, but right at the apex, there is a delayed contraction of the septum, but this is only what we realized because when we did the perfusion, and now this is the perfusion scan, we do a flash and replenishment perfusion here. So this is a perfusion scan. You can see the flash coming up in a moment now. The, mark, the, uh, the contrast is destroyed. Now you can see a lot of perfusion defect in the apex. So this is despite apparent normal wall motion abnormality. So these are examples which show the utility of contrast echo in various clinical scenario. Now, in order to get those images, you have to know what machine setting you should be using, and you should understand what the artifacts are and how to overcome that. And that's what I'm going to discuss. So you must bear with me for the next slide. I'm going to go through a bit of physics because you need to understand the relationship between transmit power the tissue response and the microbubble response. So this is looking at the transmit power, which is the power of the field uh, imparting uh, its energy on the structure that it meets. So how does a microbubble behave when the mechanical index of the transmit power is very high? This is what we use in day-to-day -day echocardiography, a mechanical index of more than one. Now, when you look at this, look at how the microbubbles behave there under that, you see how the microbubbles are vibrating and then getting destroyed, right? And if you look at the image here with that mechanical index, you will see that all the microbubbles are getting destroyed and this is not the way to image the heart. So you come down the mechanical index to say 0 0.5, but you still get a lot of harmonics from the microbubbles and you can see how 
the microorganism is uh, the harmonics are being gen uh, generated. So you can see it becomes smaller and larger, and it gives on nonlinear uh, signals in harmonics and in fundamentals. So now looking at the harmonics, it gives up lots of harmonics. The tissue also gives up harmonics. And the image that you get with this image is, you can see here, it's, it, you, know, you can uh, play it continuously. You can see the contrast continuously. So this is what you should be using. However, you will see at the apex, there's a lot of destruction of contrast. It is not an ideal image to have because it, that will give rise to artifacts. So you go down further in the mechanical index to 0 0.2. But when you do that, the harmonics are very weak, even from the micro bubbles and the tissues. Of course, it's weak. And this is an example where you are bringing down the mechanical index uh, in the harmonic mode and see what you see here. It's a very weak signal. The contrast is not very clear and it's not great. But however, what you notice here is that the fundamental signal, meaning the transistor gives off one frequency, it receives the same frequency, that is very strong. Uh, in this uh, in this low um, mechanical setting, me mechanical index setting, and it is also strong from the tissue. By the way, now if I if if we if we if we tweak from harmonic to fundamental, so this is harmonic. You can see 1.3, giving off 1.3, receiving at 2.6, and this is uh, fundamental. Just change it to fundamental mode. The image is much better, but even there you will see that the endocardium is not very clearly seen. And that is because the tissues, the, um, the extra noise from the LV, they all give a fundamental signal. That's why it contaminates the contrast. So there we use another technique called multipulse imaging. So multipulse meaning we send down two pulses. By that, we eliminate the tissue completely, but keep the contrast signals. And this is how it looks with multipulse imaging. And you can see now very clearly the contrast from apex to base. You can see the wall thickening, and you can appreciate very well how the image has improved in quality. So this is what you should be using in your day-to-day -day practice, low mechanical index, contrast-specific imaging, multipulse technique. Now remember the LVO technique, which I just showed, just by reducing the mechanical index, you are not going to improve the image because you are doing it in harmonics and harmonics become weak. You need it in fundamental mode and you need multipulse technique. So this is point number one. Now we come to how to optimize the image. So you give contrast and this is the LV. So you see that so it's a low MI image, but what you also should see is, is the, is the um, micro bubbles within the myocardium. So this is a technique, low MI, where you can look at LV structure and myocardial perfusion simultaneously. But just concentrating on the structure, you can see the wall thickening very well. You can see the epicardium well. You can see the endocardium well. And therefore, you can see the wall thickening well, which is, which is the hallmark of, uh, uh, of ischemia or any abnormality affecting the myocardium. So, so this is how you should be uh, doing it. Now, it is quite possible that we'll get image like this. So this is the patient who came to us and see what happened here. So what happened here is a huge amount of contrast was injected. As a result, there's a huge attenuation artifact here. Now, on this side, what's happening? The gains are so high that you can't make out the uh, wall thickness at all. You know, it's all blurred. It's called blooming artifact. So you need to reduce the gain. You need to give less contrast here and wait. Uh, if you had given already, then you just wait till you get back these images where now you can see it's more uniform. And you can see the wall thickening now much better than what you can see here. So this is one thing that you need to be very careful about. And the other thing that also you should be careful about is you should be giving enough contrast. Now this here, you, the amount of contrast given is not that great, though you can see wall thickening, but you are, over you are underestimating the LV volume compared to if you give a bit more contrast so that it's uniformly opacified. And now you can see Actually, when you don't give a lot of contrast, you also pick up uh, extraneous um, um, uh, echoes, which you think it's endocardium. That's not really endocardium. The compacted endocardium is here, very clearly seen. So, so you have to give enough contrast to actually opacify the left ventricle well. Now, there's another artifact that you might face, 
this is coming from the papillary muscle. Because it's coming from the papillary muscle, it looks like this is the wall of the LV. So all you need to do, and you know this is an artifact because it's going right down outside the heart. You just need to move the transducer a little bit. Now you see you've got rid of that shadow, and now you see there's a wall motion abnormality here in the anterolateral region. So it's very important to recognize these artifacts. Now, this is another artifact that we see. You inject contrast and you see swirling in the apex. And I've shown you this to you just before that. That is because you are, your mechanical index is a bit high and you're destroying the contrast. So don't use LVO setting. Go for the setting of low MI and then you can see you won't have this destruction because the MI is low. It will not destroy the contrast and you'll see a uniform opacification. And then moving on, what about perfusion imaging? Now, this is an example of perfusion here at rest. Now, you see a flash replenishment imaging again, flash. The microbes are getting destroyed. It's going to fill now, but you see an artifact here, black. But you wait for it and move your transducer, and you'll see it's filling up right at the end when you move the transducer. See, it fills up. Right at the end, it fills up because we move the transducer to get the, uh, the lateral wall within the actual plane. See, right at the end, if you watch, it, it, it will be filling up. There you are, it fills up. So that's what you need to do. And finally, you do get apical artifacts. For example, here you can see there's slightly less contrast maybe there and slightly more contrast here. So you move the focus to the apex because when you do that, you concentrate the, uh, the, the destruction right down a thin area here, not in a broad area here. So because if your focus is here, you're sending too many lines. And this especially occurs if the transducer is very near the chest. So the chest, is, uh, uh, the transducer is very near the uh, uh, apex. So the apex get the brunt of the um, mechanical index and it destroys contrast. So when you move it up, you confine it to a thin line. So now you can see how when you do a flash replenishment imaging, the apex fills up very well. See how quickly the apex fills up. Um, if you had kept it right there, you'll see there's an apical defect here. So this is overcoming apical defect um, artifact. So my take home message from this is, always use low mechanical index contrast specific imaging option. It is available in all machines and you should ask your application specialist to supply that. And if they don't, then say, I'm not going to buy a machine. Then they will supply that. <laughs> um, Always give slow bolus. Don't rush, give slow bolus because we want to opacify the LV well, and we don't want to uh, get attenuation artifact. So obtain uniform LV opacification with some myocardial opacification because you can see perfusion simultaneously. Optimize your gain so that you don't overgain it and keep the focus at the mitral valve level all the time unless you see an apical artifact or destruction, then you move the focus up to the apex you get rid of that artifact. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Roxy Senior. So um, uh, it was an outstanding presentation. Uh, we are uh, limited by, by the time, but we will be able to uh, respond to most of uh, the questions for the following 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, I just want to, to tell our audience that they will receive a link with the um, uh, registration uh, of this webinar so they can access afterwards the, the webinar. I will give the word to Professor Popescu for uh, the discussion session and for further announcements. Thank you very much. It was a real pleasure to listen to these four excellent talks. So I think we should fire a few questions, short questions, short answers if possible, so that we take more of them. Um, I have two questions for Alan. One is related to LA volume. So you said that 2D measurements of LA volume make some problems because we need to be aware of the way of uh, maximizing the cavity. Would 3D derived LA volume measurements be a solution in uh, assessing this for diastolic function assessment? Um, so, um, uh, Bogdan, very good question about um, 3D LA volumes. Um, I think compared to 2D versus let's say MRI is very limited. You probably underestimate the volumes. 
probably 3D um, LA versus MRI is probably closer. And I think the, the world should be uh, getting into to 3D. And perhaps in the next uh, rendition of the guidelines, um, we incorporate somewhere for 3D LV, uh, 3D LA. But I think the focus should be on LA strain. For, for the diastology, I think um, the phasic function may, may, may be actually uh, more important than the actual volume. So that may be another uh, added value. But 3D uh, is here to stay, as we heard from the, um, uh, from the other presenter. But um, that's an important area. Yeah, it's my impression as well. Perhaps we will need to, to, to take a close look at the cutoff value if we use the 3D volume in that case. But the, the second question was indeed about LA strain. So you think this will become a major player in diastolic function assessment in future in the main uh, algorithm of assessment? Um, I think um, that definitely uh, as the machines um, get better, um, easier to, uh, to identify LA strain, uh, even in a four chamber view, one view, uh, if the machine uh, is able to give you a output of the uh, different uh, phases, um, I think this would be very useful. Um, applications will include, you know, prediction of, um, you know, obviously uh, diastolic function indeterminate reclassifying, uh, prediction of heart failure, a um, lot of different things that's predicting LA strain. It's not as simple as that, but it's a, it's another. Thing that you'll have in your in your toolbox to assess uh, elevated film pressures. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I would have a question for uh, Professor Elip uh, Sand. So can you please just uh, maybe explain? I know it's not easy, but explain um, um, in practice how do we easily measure the PISA and the vena contracta? And and the second question would be. How do you quantify a mitral regurgitation um, in those cases where the PISA is not available? Um, right, you are right. These are everyday. Uh, these are questions coming out from uh, coming out from the everyday practice. Uh, quantification of we. You should be very careful uh, by when using PISA. Uh, to make uh, to visualize nicely the flow convergence zone, those color shells, we shift the baseline of the color uh, according to the regurgitation uh, we are looking for. If this is mitral, so you have to uh, shift the baseline in the same direction of the uh, regurgitant flow. And usually um, the Nyquist limit should be. Um, around uh, after after shifting the baseline it will it should be somewhere around 30 to 40 not more not less than this however pisa the use of pisa is very tricky uh, for example if this is a dynamic regurgitation you cannot use if this is multiple jet you cannot use if this is very convert uh, eccentric jet you cannot use unless you do some angle corrections because the pisa the hemisphere will be truncated so you cannot really apply the formula so uh, you have to know the limitations of of pisa then vena contracta would be more useful in such conditions uh, maybe or if still you are really uh, you you cannot you know that you cannot use pisa then i would recommend you to look at the morphology of the valve use 3d look at the um, functional anatomy of the of the leaflets uh, then you will come up with a better uh, with a better uh, judgment i think or you can maybe use continuity equation but this is usually uh, very cumbersome so always um get try to get different clues put them together look at the pulmonic veins uh, for example hepatic veins and uh, put them together the signal contour density kvt size and integrate all that knowledge thank you so much professor Eli. Thank you very much. I would have again two questions now for Denisa, if possible. So one complaint that we hear very often from people is that, you know, I don't use 3D because it's very time consuming and I need to move fast. 
how long does it take to analyze a 3D data set for ventricle, for the LV, for the RV? Of course, nobody compares with you in this regard, but you know, general practitioner, not the big expert. Yeah, thank you, Bogdan. Indeed, this is a, a frequent reason that comes every time uh, during uh, these presentations on 3D. And I think uh, now it has become really an excuse uh, for people not uh, implementing 3D echo in their clinical routine because uh, with the latest technology is really very fast. Indeed, in the past, we had to perform several steps during the acquisition and then also during the post-processing, but now it takes less than uh, one minute if the data set is a good quality following the, the rules, the simple rules that I have shown. Nowadays, with the help of artificial intelligence, the first step of aligning the data set and tracing the contours has become uh, completely automated. So the operator just has to look at the contours and if they are okay just to uh, look at the measurements frequently there is some need to edit and uh, uh, but it takes uh, really less than one or two minutes depending on uh, whether the patient has uh, some pathology or not so no it's no longer an, an excuse a good excuse to not perform a transthoracic 3d echo Okay, yes, and also if you practice it very often, then it gets even easier because uh, it takes less faster. time. faster, yes. The second question uh, relates to the assessment of the left ventricle by 3D. So we know LV volumes are more accurate, ejection fraction derived from 3D. Other than that, are there other applications? For example, GLS is the newcomer. Should we do it with 3D echo rather than 2D? What's your advice? or Comment on well, that. The, yeah, that is also an important point. Uh, uh, 3D strain theoretically has some advantages with respect to 2D strain, but for clinical purposes, we are still using 2D because it's uh, supported by more robust evidence. And we have some technical issues that have to be solved with 3D strain. So for the moment, I, I cannot say that uh, I prefer 3D strain. I still use 2D strain in my clinical routine. But I think something that can be done with 3D echo that probably is not so uh, popular among uh, the echocardiographer is to look at the morphology and to look at some pathologies that involve the apex. Because uh, the greatest advantage of 3D echo is uh, the ability to look at the real apex and avoid for shortening. So all the patients that have uh, myocardial non-compaction, apical hypertrophy, apical thrombus, wherever, seeing the real apex is clinically relevant. Uh, I always try to look also in 3D and uh, for instance, in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, I have identified uh, small aneurysms that were not seen by 2D. Okay, great. Yeah, so I think we have to remember that we cannot directly translate whatever goes with 2D into 3D uh, unless we make the necessary uh, adjustments or study properly. Very good advice, thanks. I also have two questions for, brief questions for, for Roxy, if yeah. I may. So again, one is a bit that I hear this sometimes, you know, it's again about GLS. So people think that if you are able with the son of you, with whatever transpulmonary contrast to visualize better the LV and uh, measure volumes and EF, would it, this, be possible also that this helps you in measuring GLS by speckle tracking? Yeah, that's a good question. In fact, we've done, we published data on that about two years ago. Now with GLS, the problem that contrast could have is because the contrast goes into the myocardium, it, it disturbs the speckle tracking. However, when you use this, this low MI setting, which I've, you know, which I've described, there, even if the contrast goes into the myocardium, you can get rid of that contrast with a flash. So when you get rid of that with the flash, you get a beautiful endocardium, you get a beautiful epicardium, and in between, you see a lot of speckled speckles there. And that's where you get your speckled, uh, speckled data. And in fact, we compared it with non-contrast uh, 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 speckled data, the, spec, uh, the, uh, the, the one with contrast where you destroy the microbubbles and see it has a better reproducibility 
than non-contrast because it gives you consistent data. So it is very feasible and you know we, sh we should be using it if you're using contrast. Mm -hmm. Great, yeah, I think that's great practical advice. And the second one is also very practical. Uh, it's about single dose versus continuous infusion. It's also logistically problematic because many, you know, in many labs, people don't have a, a pump. So when would you advise when is it really compulsory, so to say, to have a continuous infusion? When can you just live with the bolus injection? Oh. Yeah, so bolus you can live with just to look at LV uh, structure, function, ejection fraction, etc. Bolus is absolutely fine, and slow bolus, and it actually you know does. If you give slowly, it stays in the circulation for longer time, and because you're replenishing it slowly, so you get a more a good uniform opacification, and you and with bolus it's great. But if you're looking at perfusion. There, I would advise that they, it should be by infusion, and you don't necessarily need a, a pump to do that. You can put it in, you know, in a, uh, a, a in a bag of saline, and then you know you just uh, uh, pass it. Uh, you know, for each contrast agent, there are different rates at which you use it. So all you need to do is to do that, and it will work equally well. Except the pump, the one that the Braco has is a very, it's very nice actually, it's automatic. You don't have to do anything after starting the pump. While with the, with, with normal saline, et cetera, somebody needs to shake the bag all the time so that it is in suspension. But even then, because there are two people in the lab anyway, so one can do that while the infusion is going on. So for, for perfusion, you need uh, to do infusion, um, Infuse, uh, infuse contrast. Thank you so much, Professor Oxsenior. So, uh, two quick questions for uh, Professor Klein. Um, maybe he will be able to uh, respond um, uh, uh, rapidly. Maybe less than one minute for each question. So, Professor Klein, uh, do you think that uh, in the near future, the uh, LA strain imaging will become increasingly important for the evaluation of diastolic function? And the second question is also related to uh, left atrium. So should we add, add the uh, LA strain besides GLS in the evaluation of cardio-oncology patients? Um, to answer both questions, uh, very important. I, I predict, I think in the next um, guidelines, uh, GLS and LA, uh, LAS, uh, LARS will, will be included. It's very it's simplified now, uh, accurate measure. Um, Cardio oncology, um, I think it's a uh, it's good physiology. Um, if the if the cardio oncology drug uh, perhaps damages the LV, perhaps there's some um, impairment of the LA, and uh, I, I think both will be recorded. How the clinician uses them is another thing, uh, but he'll have that information. Um, and as I said, just from a four chamber view, you can get a lot of good information uh, measured accurately. Uh, the LA is a very thin structure, so you it need to be uh, good measurements um, uh, for this. I predict uh, we use routinely. Okay, great. So sadly, time is flying and we'll need to close very soon. But we have some good news. And this is one that you will be able to look at the recording of it. And uh, Alexander will tell you more about this in the end. And the second one, I will also take the opportunity to invite you to attend 11 and 12th of December, the EACVI Best of Imaging 2020. It will be a great event. It's the first virtual event that the EACVI is organizing. Uh, but we hope that it will be very in interesting because of the great program. Take advantage of it and participate. The registration is free. One day and a half of great program on three channels. And uh, please join us there. It was a great pleasure for me to listen to all your presentations. And again, I'd like to thank all of you and uh, Alexandru before passing the final words to him. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Popescu. Thank you for being here. I'd like to thank uh, you and all the speakers. Thank you for your time. Uh, just uh, want to say that uh, this uh, recording will be available tomorrow. You, um, each uh, subscriber will receive a link. Um, and um, I hope I will see you next time uh, in the near future at another uh, webinar. Thank you so much.
for doing this and thank you for your time. Have a nice evening. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.